Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Catherine Mansfield's short story The Fly. Uh, so we've already had some lectures on this so we'll just continue we work from where we left off last time. So we're seeing how this story is obviously very modernist in terms of looking at memory, in terms of looking at trauma and streams of consciousness but also and equally uh, this is a story about masculinity and masculinity crisis post First World War, something which we've seen already in Mrs. Dalloway and also to a lesser extent in Eliot's early poetry. Now, what is very obvious in the story is how there's an allegorical quality about uh, the characterization. So the boss and the boss's son uh, are very allegorically uh, representative of certain kinds of masculinity, the boss being uh, that of robust, domineering, uh, hegemonic masculinity, uh, socially uh, prestigious, you know, earning lots of money, healthy, robust, etc. Whereas the son is someone who's supposed to step into that uh, same shoe uh, and we see how the First World War, which can also be seen as a masculinist event uh, or a masculinist expansionist event of greed and uh, territorialization, uh, ironically the First World War actually interrupts uh, this masculine generative in, in the sense of killing the son. So the boss's son has been killed in the war and we see how that interrupts the entire narrative um, in the story. And contrasted with the boss we have uh, someone like Mr. Woodyfield who is obviously very senile very fragile and who represents a very you know, an almost disembodied kind of masculinity, enervated, exhausted, etc. Uh, and the exhaustion and enervation are quite obvious in Woodfield's characterization. Uh, and we see how um, he seemed to have moved on from the point of trauma. I mean, he too had lost his son in the war. Uh, his son is called Reggie, and uh, we see how uh, his wife Gertrude and, and his daughters had been to Belgium to take a look at his son's grave. Uh, and he wasn't there in the sense in, in Belgium. So, you know, he's represented the whole story of visiting the son's grave in, in a second-hand information way to the boss. And we saw how uh, the entire metaphor, the entire rhetoric, the entire vocabulary uh, in terms of how Woodfield describes the son's grave is very touristy kind of vocabulary, very touristy kind of rhetoric. It's not really uh, the rhetoric of a bereaving father. Uh, or a mourning father, and, and, you know, instead it's the rhetoric of a visitor, a tourist, who goes and looks at, you know, the gaze is very touristy and the gaze is important over here because he goes and uh, he describes, he hasn't been there, but he describes how the parts are nice and broad, how the graveyards are beautiful looked after, then he talks about the price of jam in the hotels, etc., and how the entire hotel industry is blossoming around this trauma tourism as it were. Uh, but what obviously gets or doesn't get highlighted, uh, or rather what's an inconspic what's a, what's a conspicuous absence in Woodfield's description is any real sentiment for his son's loss. And conspicuous absence is a very important thing in Mansfield's fiction because it's a very, uh, as you can see from the story, it's a very economic kind of expression, there's an economy of expression, it's very minimalist, very sparse in terms of how it is represented uh, and you know, there's a lot of things packed into it. Uh, so, uh, conspicuous absence becomes a very important point. So, for instance, uh, there's no mention at all about the boss's wife or the son's daughter, uh, the son's uh, uh, mother, uh, who happened to be the boss's wife. So, the mother is conspicuously absent in the story. There's no mother figure at all. It's entirely about the boss and his heir, uh, the son, uh, and how his heir, less than because the son, has been killed in the war. So, this very masculinist kind of um, uh, universe is something which is obviously parodied and critiqued by Mansfield. This is a very scarring feminist critique on the First World War. And the only woman we get to know are uh, uh, Woodyfield's uh, wife and daughter. So we see how uh, post First World War, they seem to have more agency over Woodyfield. I and mean, they seem to decide when he's released to the city, they seem to decide to dress him up, to brush him and release him to the city just so he can go and visit his old friends. And also they are the ones who travel to Belgium to take a look at his son's grave and not Woodyfield. Woodyfield is just reporting what he heard from the woman back to the boss. Uh, we see how at the beginning of the story how the boss had very um, almost violently decided or tried or orchestrate or engineer this entire architecture of newness around them, right? Everything is new, the copper is new, the heating is new, the bookcases are new, etc. But amidst all this newness, there's a spectral photograph for the boy, something which is quite old and almost six years old. 
And obviously we know now that the, the photograph of the, bo of the boy is exactly what holds the key to the boss's trauma. Now, before I move on uh, to the next section where Woodfield has left the room and was, you know, had been patronizing him in the beginning, poured him whiskey, uh, had said a very sexist comment on woman's uh, lack of understanding, uh, so that all that hegemonic masculinity bits were all covered and marked and embodied. Now, the moment uh, the grave of the boss's uh, son was mentioned, the, the moment the grave of the uh, Woodyfield son was mentioned, that is the moment when the boss's masculinity is sort of shaken up a little bit because we see now that he doesn't really have a male heir to carry on his kingdom per se. Right? So this um, heirlessness is something which is becoming obviously part of the uh, loss, the sense of existential loss the boss suffers now. Now, what this story does, and I, I have an article which I'm happy to upload in the course of this, uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, NPTEL course, Trends Science Fiction, I have an article, published article on this particular story that I'm, I'm happy to share in the platform that we have. Uh, but in that article and also elsewhere and also here, I would like to make the argument that there's a very perverse equation over here between masculinity and trauma or traumatophilia or hysteria to some extent. Now, Hysteria, as some of you would know, uh, had traditionally been medicalized as a female malady, something which happens only to women because it's part of the woman's body and, and the, male, the male body cannot nev can never be hysteric. Now, obviously, that all changed with the First World War because post-First World War, we had something called the shell shock, uh, which is something which anticipated what we now call PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, where we have this very muscular, strong, manly men coming back from the trenches, shivering like children, shivering like quote-unquote women. Uh, so suddenly it was very spectacularly evident that men could also be nervous, men could also be hysteric. And obviously hysteria had been always historically medicalized as a female disease, a female malady, so a new name had to be given to this male condition. And the new name uh, for a point of time was shell shock and then later on of course it became more uh, classified medically in military medicine uh, as PTSD. Now, interestingly, in this particular story, what we get to see in a moment, we'll see how the boss uh, basically congratulates himself on his masculinity by retaining in his mind the original moment of trauma, the original experience of trauma. In other words, he, he always wants to feel exactly the same way as he felt six years ago when the first news of his son's death came to him, right? So that was a big moment for him and his loss in his mind is bigger than anyone else's loss. Right? And that sense of superiority, that sense of entitlement to one's trauma is a very perverse thing but it's, it's exactly what happens over here. So he has a sense of entitlement to his trauma and, and at one point he will say, uh, he will think and it will be told to us that other men might live the lost on, other men might move on, other men might just make uh, peace with it. But he the boss can never do it because his son is dead and that's a very, very special kind of tragedy. So we can see how the equation between trauma and masculinity gets uh, uh, established in the story uh, in a very, very uh, complex psychological manner. Okay, so we see this point uh, where the Woodfield is about to leave, uh, leave the boss's office and uh, is the boss seeing him out. Uh, he came round this desk, and this should be on his screen. He came round uh, by his desk, following the shuffling footsteps to the door, and saw the old fellow out. Woodfield was gone. For a long moment, the boss stayed, staring at nothing. So again, we can say this is probably staring at nothingness, which is staring back at him, right? Staring at nothing. While the grey-haired office messenger watching him dodge in and out of his cubbyhole like a dog that expects to be taken for a run. So again, look at the uh, you know, animal metaphors used over here, the infantilized metaphors, the animal metaphors all be used uh, very, very interestingly. Right, so, and then he says, I'll see nobody for half an hour, Macy, said the boss, nobody at all. So we see how even the office messenger has a name, Macy, but the boss and the son don't have a name at all. So again, this is part of the allegorical quality about this categorization over here. Very good, sir. So Macy's obviously, his job is to say yes to whatever the boss says. The door is shut. The firm, heavy footsteps, the firm, heavy steps recross the bright carpet. The fat body plumped down in the spring chair and leaning forward, the boss covered his face with his hands. He wanted, he intended, he had arranged to weep. So the last bit is interesting over here. We can see how the boss is making this entire ritual about weeping. He's going back to his office, his, um, his fat body is plumped down in a spring chair and he's covering his face with his hands and he, we told that he wanted he intended, he had arranged to weep. So the entire idea of weeping, the entire idea of hysteria, a mourning becomes a masculinist activity over here, which is a subversion in some sense of the stereotypical understanding of mourning and, and, and hysteria. 
But the interesting thing is the boss here wants to appropriate the sentiment of mourning uh, and add that to his masculinity and he wants to appropriate the sentiment of hysteria and add that to his masculinity, right? So, uh, the whole idea of equating masculinity and trauma becomes interesting and we see over here how we are told that he wanted, he intended, he had arranged to weep. So, weeping obviously becomes a ritual, a part of the ritual, a fallout of the ritual. So, he had intended, he had arranged to weep and he better start weeping now. So, that becomes part of the masculine, almost muscular control or motor control over his own senses. So, he seems to have, he wants to have entire ownership or absolute ownership of his motor mechanisms including weeping. It had been a terrible shock, we get this backstory now a little bit. It had been a terrible shock to him when old Woodyfield sprang the remark upon the boy's grave. It was exactly as though the earth had opened and he had seen the boy lying there with Woodyfield's girls staring down at him. So, again, uh, this becomes almost like a Medusa stare where the woman look at the man and turn them into stones. He's literally a stone, it's literally a tombstone now and in, in some of his uh, dreams or nightmares or visions, the boss thinks that his grave, the sun is opening up and the sun is inside the grave lying unblemished forever. So, there's no degeneration whatever, but Woodyfield's daughters and wife are staring at him. It's very um, freezing, Medusa kind of a stare that a woman gives to the man away and that in a sense, uh, is an experience of emasculation for the boss as well as for the son who is dead now. Right, so the son is um, uh, immobile, almost stuck in the coffin, uh, it doesn't know what to go, doesn't know what to do and the woman is staring at him as if, you know, they're turning him into a stone further. Right, so for it was strange, uh, although so over six years have passed away, the boss never thought of the boy except as lying unchanged. So, the, in the boss's mind, the boy had always remained unchanged. You know, six years ago, whatever he looked like, whatever he seemed like, is exactly the way he had stayed in the boss's imagination. Okay, unblemished in his uniform, asleep forever. My son groaned the boss, but no tears came yet. Uh, in the past, in the, in, in the first months and even years after the boy's dead, he had only to say those words to be overcome by such a grief that nothing short of a violent fit of weeping could relieve him. So, this is the point in the, in the story where we begin to get a sense of the boss's hubris. You know what a hubris is? Hubris is false pride. It's something which you borrow from the Greek tragedies, something which is uh, almost all tragic heroes. Uh, they're otherwise impeccable, they're otherwise perfect, they're otherwise uh, very, very good and caring, except the fact that they have hubris, they think too highly of themselves, the, the vanity uh, overshoots, uh, eclipses the good work that they do. So, you know, and the boss over here obviously uh, will exhibit hubris, you know, you know he, he would tell himself that his son was the only son, so everyone else might be moving on, but he doesn't want to move on, he cannot move on because, you know, uh, his son is the only son. So, you know, we see how he also taught himself in his mind that he can control his emotions, he can control his uh, crying at will. Right, so I can cry anytime I want to. I can I, I can emote anytime I want to, as far as far as my son's death is concerned, and remembering that is concerned. Okay, and this is a hubristic statement that he had made earlier to people. Time he had declared them. He had told everybody could make no difference. Other men might perhaps might, might perhaps might recover, might live the loss down, but not he. So again, this is a classic hubris statement where he says, "I, I defy time." Uh, I challenge time to dry up my weep and that's exactly what's happened in the story. This becomes almost a revenge of time in some sense. But the boss at this point at least wants to enact, you know, some kind of a revenge on time where he tells time openly that, you know, other men might live down, but no matter how much time goes away, I'm going to st be stuck to this mourning uh, figure forever, right? So, I'll be the perfect mourner. Uh, so, time could make no difference. Other men uh, perhaps might recover, might live the loss down, but not he. So, again, this hubristic understanding of himself becomes interesting over here. Other men might live the loss, so other men may move on, but not he, not me. I lost my only son, except as if he was the only father with an only son in the entire uh, Europe, in the entire uh, world, fighting the First World War. Okay. Uh, other men might live the loss down, might recover, might live the loss down, but not he. How was it possible? His boy was an only son. So, it's almost as if no one else had an only son who got killed in the war. But again, look at the very myopic, parochial and also quite uh, entitled view of the boss, uh, only son. Uh, ever since his birth, the boss had worked as building uh, up his business for him. It, it had no other meaning if it was not for the boy. Life itself had come no other meaning. How on earth could he have slaved, denied himself, kept going all these years 
without a promise forever before him are the boys stepping into the shoes and carrying on where he left off. So again, look at the conspicuous absence of the woman figure over here, the conspicuous absence of the boss's wife or the, the son's mother over here. So everything is projected to the boss, everything is focalized to the boss. Obviously that is critiqued by Mansfield in a very, very subtle and scathing manner. Uh, but what he's saying, uh, when, uh, what the boss is thinking over here is, you know, uh, the entire life of the boss had been to prepare something which the person like him, same genes, same blood, same body, will step in and carry on. And hopefully at some point his son will also emerge and he will give him this kingdom. So it becomes a cons constant and endless chain process and endlessness is exactly what is interrupted by the death of the son. And that's something which we'll come back to later. Okay, so he, he was a very promising son who's beginning to flower as an employee, as a, as a boss, as someone who's devastating and ruthless and cunning in business, which is exactly what the boss is. Uh, but then all that has come to an end because of one incident. And again, look at the way how this incident has, has been narrated to us. And that promise had been so near been fulfilled. The boy had come in office learning the ropes for a year before the war. So the boy was come with the, to the office learning the, the, about the trade, you know, getting accustomed to the trade for almost one year before joining office. Every morning they had started off together. They had come back with the same train. So the boss and the son, they would go out together, you know, the boss would go to his cabin, the son would go to do the site perhaps, and then he would do some very, very uh, menial jobs which is going to please the boss quite well. Right. So we were told that you know every time they used to go out together, come back together, and this entire narrative of intimacy between the boss and the son is interesting because again the other parent is absent, the other uh, the spouse is absent, the mother figure, the wife figure is entirely absent. We don't even tell if she's alive or dead. Is that is that sense of absence which is there, which is articulated over here? And what congratulations he had received as a boy's father. No wonder uh, he had taken to it marvelously. As to his popularity with the staff, every man, Jack of them, down to old Macy, couldn't make enough of the boy. And he wasn't in the least spoiled. No, he was, he was just, say, his bright natural self, uh, with the right words for everybody, with that boyish look and uh, the habit of saying simply splendid. Now, this bit is interesting. If you want to take a look at uh, and those of you interested in, in research and masculinity, uh, this is definitely a very key point. If you take a look at the rhetoric used in this uh, particular point, simply splendid and not least be spoiled, very industrious, uh, you know, and very, very enterprising. Now, this is exactly uh, the brand of masculinity uh, created by the Boy Scout movements in Europe and America and other parts of England, uh, especially uh, uh, in, in, in England. And this brand of Boy Scout masculinity is exactly what informed the empire uh, and the entire imperial expansion. Now, the boy over here is obviously part of the imperial expansionist program because the boy is someone, uh, we don't quite know what the boss's business is, but obviously he seems to be quite ruthless in terms of his business enterprise. So it could be something which is morally dubious, we don't quite know. But the whole point is the son was prepared, was being groomed, was being trained to take over the kingdom uh, from where the boss had left. Right? And he seems to be this very boyish, uh, enterprising, industrious kind of a person who everyone likes. So he's, he was, he's got this boyish look and he had this habit of saying simply splendid. So everything was simply splendid to him. He made it alliterate. And again, that becomes a very, very um, boyish, boy scoutish kind of a movement, uh, boy scoutish kind of a rhetoric uh, used by the boy over here. So we see how the entire construct of masculinity is at play away. The boy is someone who's supposed to take over from the boss and, and how this entire takeover is supposed to take place in a very seamless way. And the seamlessness is inter interrupted exactly by the First World War and this is what we are told. But all that was over and done with as though it never had been. So in one flash, for instance, everything came to an end. And how so? The day had come when Macy had handed him the telegram that brought the whole place crushing about his head. Deeply regret to inform you that I had left the office a broken man with his life in ruins. So this is a very standard t telegram sent out to all the um, you know, parents who lost their sons in the war. So if you see movies of first war, we find that there's a long template which is being typed up with a typewriter. We regret to inform you, and there's a blank uh, space to which in which the name is filled in, other biographical details are filled in. But the, the, the template is very standardized, and that actually makes it very very cool. The fact that the institution of military is uh, letting you know that you've lost a dear one in the war and then the entire impersonal touch makes it even more menacing. So the rhetoric over here is quite impersonal in quality and that had obviously fueled the boss's trauma. Okay, 
uh, so deeply regretted to inform you and he had left the office a broken man, his life in ruin. So again, if we, if we take this point and go back to the beginning of the story, we find how the boss is trying to reconstruct himself. So he had been broken by the First World War, by the death of his son, and now is making an effort to reconstruct himself by getting more material markers and electric heating, you know, uh, and different kinds of things, right? Um, six years ago, six years, how quickly time passed. Uh, it might have happened yesterday. The boss took his hands from his face. He was puzzled. Something seemed to be wrong with him. He wasn't feeling as he wanted to feel. Uh, he, he decided to get up and have a look at the boy's, boy's photograph. It wasn't a favorite photograph of his. The expression was unnatural. It was cold, even stern looking. The boy had never looked like that. So again, the, this is a moment of epiphany for the uh, boss's son. Uh, you know, and the boss is obviously looking at the boss's son uh, through a very focalized frame over here. And a focalized frame is a, is a, is a photograph. Uh, interestingly, this is a photograph which is supposed to project a certain sentiment to the boss. He wants to cry, he wants to weep out his sorrow, his, he wants to weep out his moaning, and he's looking at a photograph to, to get a trigger off from which he, he's going to weep. But then he realizes this is not a good photograph of the sun, so he needs a different photograph. So it almost becomes something erotic in quality. I, I'm looking at a photograph. Uh, to have an erotic experience. So this release that the boss talks about over here is obviously there's a, there's a quasi erotic quality about this release because that also reestablishes his masculinity because you know he thinks he's in, in complete control of everything around him uh, and the sense of control gives him a sense of entitlement. Uh, so he needs to know everything, he needs to have this entire knowledge of everything. So that brand of masculinity which is all controlling, all knowing, all traveling that's, that's come to an end over here after the first world war and hence so we have Woody Fields locked up in his house. So this, the old traveling bit is completely gone. Uh, the son, the daughter, the, 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 the wife, they all take over in terms of running the household and they only grant him permission to come to the city every day except uh, you know every day, every Tuesday, uh, every week, right. So that becomes his only relief that he can look forward to, right. Uh, so the question of agency becomes important in this sense because agency stereotypically has always been a manly enterprise but, but, but post first world war we find how agency becomes more sort of inverted in quality. It is the wife and the daughters who travel to Belgium, it is they who report back and bother the jam, it is they who haggle with the jam prices uh, you know, in the hotel rooms uh, and like I said it is they who give a report to the trauma in, in terms of how uh, the, the traumatic, the, the sites are kept now in terms of the buried soldiers, right. So that, that degree of mobility and agency is now conferred or now visible with the women rather than the men. The men obviously are uh, senile and they're waiting to die. They're two bereaving fathers uh, and they obviously uh, quite, uh, they've got nothing to look forward to. The only thing they had to look forward to is the sons. The, the creation of the sons in terms of being heirs to the kingdom, but that possibility is now permanently uh, gone, it's precluded. Okay, so he's trying to take a look at the boy's photograph and relieve himself by crying, right? He's got his clothes off his and he's looking at a photo and tries to relieve himself to a very bodily functional way. But we are told that the, you know, the boss is unable to carry out, it's almost a performance anxiety uh, about weeping. So again, if you take a look at weeping, mourning, uh, hysteric weeping or hysteric moaning, these are stereotypically speaking very, very uh, feminine activities, quote unquote feminine, whatever that means. But the boss is trying to appropriate those activities in terms of re-establishing his masculinity. So that therein lies a complication in this story. Right, so he's trying to look at the famous photograph of the boy that which that, that would help him to weep, that would help him to uh, gush out his pent up emotions, but he cannot find anything at all. Okay. Uh, and then you know, obviously we are told that the expression was unnatural, it was cool, even stern looking, right. So it is not really warm at the way the boss wanted it. At that moment, the boss noticed that a fly had fallen into the broad ink pot. So this is the point of the story where the fly episode takes place, it is obviously quite symbolic in quality as well, right. So you see the uh, fly fall into his you know, black ink pot and was trying feebly but desperately to clamber out again. Help, help, said a struggling leg. So again, look at the way in which the entire insert is now magnified, and right? So we can see the leg, we can see the front leg, we can see the back leg, we can see the two wings, everything can be seen in a very magnified way, right? So that becomes an interesting way of representation. At that moment, the boss noticed a fly, a fly had fallen into this, uh, his broad ink pot. I was trying feebly but desperate to clamber out again. Help, help, said the struggling legs. But the sides of the bankrupt, were, uh, sides of the ink pot were wet 
and slippery. It fell back again and began to swim. So it's becoming a bit of a Sisyphean enterprise, right? So it's like a birth of Sisyphus, where you know you, you push a clock on top of a push a stone on top of a wall, and then a, the stone rolls on again. You have to go to do it again, and you're doomed to do it forever, right? So there's a Sisyphean quality about the uh, the fly away. He's got a blot of ink falling on him. He's obviously very injured. But he wants to get another chance. He wants to leave this place as soon as possible. So he has it. Uh, the, the, the fly obviously is exhibiting the kind of masculinity that the boss wanted his son to exhibit, and the boss wanted himself to exhibit, right? So you know. Uh, so it fell back again and began to swim. Uh, the boss took up a pen, picked the fly out of the ink, and shook it on the piece of blotting paper. So he takes out the fly and puts it in the blotting paper. Uh, for a fraction of a second, it lay still on the dark patch that oozed around it. Then the front legs waved, uh, took over, uh, and pulling and uh, you know his small sodden body up, it began the immense task of cleaning the ink from his wings. So what happens is the boss rescues uh, the fly, fair enough, but he also drops uh, a blot of ink on her. So now obviously she's very very uh, concerned. Uh, you know the fly becomes concerned, and the fly tries to restart the entire process. So again, this whole idea of restarting and returning the to the point of action gives it a Sisyphean quality. It's like the fly is doomed forever to keep restarting. Okay. So uh, for a fraction of a second, it lay still on the dark patch uh, that oozed around it. Then the front legs waved, took hold, and pulling a small sodden body up. Uh, it, be it began the immense task of cleaning the tank, uh, the, fr the ink from his wings. So again, you know, it's trying to clear the wings from his ink because it can't fly with such heavy ink on it. Okay, over and under, over and under, went the leg along the wing as um, the stone goes under the skites, over and under the skites. So the stone skite metaphor is interesting because skite has traditionally been seen as a vehicle of death, right? So if you find old medieval uh, tragedies, you find a scribe. Um, uh, they always come in uh, with this sense of debt and this whole idea of uh, having this, um, uh, this skite metaphor. The skite metaphor is something which uh, carries a degree of mortality to it in a very symbolic way. right? So we know already if we read this metaphor close enough, we know already the fly is doomed uh, into performing something that you know, would lead to its ultimate demise. Now, there was a pause. While the fly seeming to stand on the tip of the toes, tried to expand first one wing and then the other. It succeeded at last, and sitting down, it began like a minute cat to clean his face. Again, uh, the fly had been careful with his wings, and now uh, he feels he sits in front of the um, uh, you know the, the the entire magnification takes place over here, and we find that uh, how the the fly is equated with a minute cat. And not just that, if you take a look at the description of the fly, the 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 legs. The, uh, you know, the, the, the entire right leg, left leg thing as if it was a human being has been shown in very graphic and magnified detail. So the magnification is interesting over here. The looking at a fly uh, was almost big enough to be a minute cat. So you know, if you can compare how big the fly is, it's obviously very hyperbolic in quality. Uh, no one could imagine that the little front legs rubbed against each other uh, lightly, joyfully. The horrible danger was over. It had escaped. It was ready for life again, right? So. But then Jesse Boss had an, uh, an idea. He plunged the spank back into the ink, licked his, uh, leaned his thick wrist on a blotting paper, and as the fly tried his wings, down came a great heavy blot. So that the boss at this point, he wanted to torture the fly. And this becomes interesting because what happens is it becomes an episode of sadomasochism. So the boss is obviously torturing the fly and it tries to get tortured. But at the same time, the boss is torturing himself because he sees in the struggle with the fly, a projection of his own struggle. So he wants the fly to win at one point because that, that would also mean he would win, right? So uh, th there's a very interesting uh, idea of empathy that is created over here, albeit through torture. So the boss is torturing the fly, but in the process he's getting more and more empathetic to the fly in some sense, right? So that, that's what makes it sadomasochistic. So it's sadist is torturing the fly as masochistic is also torturing himself and that, that loop becomes interesting for us to examine. Okay, um, so he plunged his pen back to the ink, leaned his thick wrist on a blotting paper, and as a fly tried his wings, down came a great heavy blot. What would make of that? What indeed? The little beggar seemed absolutely coward. So, you know, again, the word beggar is important, you know, as a human being. So, you can see how flies are, the, the fly is increasingly uh, equated with bigger animals. So, first, uh, there's a degree of deer and monkey, and then, then uh, you know, the whole idea of the fly becoming uh, something like cat-like becomes interesting, right? So, uh, 
we see the dog image also before and all these animal metaphors become interesting because in a very literal and symbolic sense this is almost like a post-human world right the first world war just ended and the demography is very different uh, we can see in the story the there's a very conspicuous absence of women uh, but also the death of all the young men the young men are all gone they're all dead so what if your son is dead the boss's uh, son is dead so the entire demography becomes very disturbed demography right so in the sense all these animal metaphors become important in uh, this short story because you know we take a look at the uh, the, the cat image over here, the dog image is used to uh, describe uh, uh, Macy, the boss's messenger. And so the whole idea is to, you know, Mansfield obviously trying to tell us that this is a universe where the able men are all gone. So this is a very differently abled kind of a universe, a very differently abled kind of a cosmos, right? And also the, uh, the woman over here are very conspicuously absent, so that becomes interesting. Now, uh, the whole idea of using the cat over here is interesting because uh, it's obviously magnifying the creature uh, and its magnification is it, it just becomes also an act of deceleration, right? So uh, we see how the entire episode is decelerated uh, in a very, very uh, interesting sense. It, the deceleration obviously dramatizes what happens. So the boss is dropping blots of ink on the cat, uh, on the on the fly, which is equated with the cat. But we see how the, each drop is described in great details and almost slowed down time. And the slowed down time becomes important, just like the magnification of the uh, in the fly's body becomes important, right? So the the fly's body almost get corporealized. So there's a degree of corporealization of time as well as the fly's body. Okay. Uh, so, and also the whole idea of the little beggar becomes important because a fly is compared to a little beggar and also this, uh, this particular description obviously comes from a very patronizing, offensive, uh, masculinist position of privilege where someone who is underprivileged becomes a little beggar and the fly away becomes a little beggar. Again, very boy scout, elitist, uh, entitled sense of masculinity which is uh, which has been voiced over here uh, through this user expression. The little beggar seemed absolutely cowed, stunned and afraid to move because of what would happen next, right? But then as a, as a painfully it dragged itself forward, the front legs waved, uh, caught hold and more slowly this time the task began from the beginning, right? So again, uh, the degree of deceleration is important, it's more slow uh, and also look at the way in which the front legs have been described. I mean normally we look at a fly, we don't see the legs. This is one little tiny thing, but it's magnified and the entire process decelerated. So we see how the front legs are waving, catching hold and slowly beginning to move. Um, so this is what I mean by the Sisyphean quality uh, of the entire episode where those of you who are aware of the myth of Sisyphus would know that you know he was doomed to push uh, a, a stone against so a mountain and it go up all the mountain and the stone would fall down again and he would doomed to he was doomed to you know, just carry on this task forever. So Sisyphus obviously represents a sense of purposelessness and he becomes a very important symbol in existentialist literature, especially in the works of Jean Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. Uh, and you know, uh, Mansfield obviously draws on that Sisyphus image quite heavily over here. Uh, is a plucky little devil, thought the boss, and I felt a real admiration for the fly's courage. Now, this is interesting because, again, if you look at the metaphor, he's a plucky little devil, right? So, this is a very boy scout, uh, almost like a head coach uh, goading on the star player. You know, you're a plucky devil, go beat it, uh, you can do it. So, it becomes a bit of a pep talk kind of uh, rhetoric over here. Uh, again, very, very masculinist in quality. He's a plucky little devil to the boss and I felt a real admiration for the fly's courage. That was the way to tackle things. Uh, that was the right spirit, never said die. It was only a question of. So again, this, this vocabulary is very, very masculinist in quality. That's the way to do it. That's the right spirit, never said die, etc. It's almost like a coach goading on a player to do something. There's a sporting image about it, a sporting uh, quality about this particular vocabulary. It was only a question of. But the fly had once again finished its laborious task uh, and the boss had just time to refill his pen to shake fair and square on a new clean body, yet another dark drop. What about it this time? A painful moment of suspense followed. But behold, the front legs were again waving and the boss felt a rush of relief. So again, this is what I meant when I said that 
uh, it is pseudo masochistic because on the one hand the fly is a fly and the boss is a boss but on the other hand uh, there's a degree of empathy that a boss creates with a fly because a fly's struggle in a way reminds him of his struggle and in a way he wants the fly to win because the fly's victory would be a very symbolic statement of the boss's own victory there'll be motivation for the boss to draw on uh, but obviously he keeps dodging the fly in the same time so it becomes a very interesting relationship uh, of torture and empathy which is simultaneously present both these sentiments are simultaneously present okay uh, so the boss drops another blot of ink what bothers this time a painful moment of suspense followed but behold the front legs are again waving the boss felt a rush of relief so again that's what this is what i meant when i said he wants the fly to win he leaned over the fly and said to it tenderly you offer a little b and this b could be any word yeah, which is obviously, uh, 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 you know, offensive in quality, but in a masculine way, it means something positive, right? So, uh, and again, look at the word tenderly. He's just leaning on the fly and telling it tenderly. It's almost like he's caressing the fly, just like we saw that, uh, you know, he wants the fly to win, etc. Uh, and then we see this interesting thing, and he actually had the brilliant notion of breathing on it to help the drying process, right? So he's actually trying to breathe on the fly. Uh, to help it dry itself, at, well, at the same time being the person who dropped the ink in the first place. So we see this very curious uh, commingling of torture and empathy at play over here. So he is uh, both a torturer as well as a tortured uh, the boss. So he's feeling tortured with the fly, and in the process, he's trying to help the fly to um, to come out of it, to, you know, to, to uh, get itself dry. All the same, there was something timid and weak about his efforts now, and the boss decided that this time should be the last and I dip the pen deep into the ink pot. So again, the last blot is about to come now. The boss tries one more time uh, to drop a blot of ink on the fly and see what happens. It was. Now, I, every time I read this story, I'm reminded of the this terrible sense of finality that is there in this one sentence, it was, with just two words, right? So the sense of finality, the sense of mortality, the sense of ending that is there uh, is so brilliantly captured by this very short sentence, it was. So, you know, everything comes to an end. It was. The last blot fell in the soaked blot in paper and the draggled fly lay in it and did not stir. The back legs were stuck to the body, the front legs were not to be seen. So again, it becomes a very mangled body as you can see and again, uh, this almost becomes a human body in a sense and we can always safely say that the fly becomes something of a projection of the boss's son. Uh, this is perhaps the way he died. Uh, the front legs are mangled and the back legs are not to be seen. The front legs are not to be seen. The back legs are stuck to the body. Again, this is a very typical image of a bombed human soldier, right? A bomb dropping on a trench and a soldier's body getting mangled, or the limbs getting mangled and stuck to the body and some is disappearing. Uh, some limbs disappearing. So this whole idea of the mangled body becomes um, a very graphic description over here, a very disturbing description over here. And it's interesting how uh, the description is projected onto the body of the fly. This is what I meant when I say the fly is corporealized in a very, very human way. So the fly becomes human, humanized and corporealized and only in the sense of suffering and torture. Come on, so the boss look sharp and stirred the, it with a pen in vain. Nothing happened or was likely to happen. The fly was dead. So again, the boss is trying to gold the fly. And again, this is a very complex psychological uh, uh, statement that we can make that uh, when you say the boss had, you know, he felt a degree of admiration and empathy for the fly's um, courage to come out of this uh, torture chamber. Uh, but at the same time, he had constantly tortured him, uh, playing the god as was a victim together. And now when the fly is dead, he's trying to goad it uh, to make it come back to life, just so the fly is coming back to life, the fly is winning, will be a motivation for him. But then the fly's death reminds him of his own death, reminds him of his imminent mortality, reminds him of his imminent wait uh, for an ending, and obviously reminds him of his son's death. He started with a spell in vain, nothing happened or was likely to happen, the fly was dead. Again, a degree of finality and an ending about his statement. The boss lifted the corpse on the end of the paper knife and flung it in the west paper basket. So again, if you look at the movements over here, are very, very interesting. The word corpse is used, which is obviously used for human bodies. So the fly is described as a human body. So the fly's body, you know, it's strange that you talked about the fly's body. The fly is a creature, but everything is magnified and decelerated. As I mentioned, the fly's body is now corporealized and it's lifted with a paper knife uh, and flung in the west paper basket again. This is very, very iconic because in the First World War, this is exactly how the soldiers' dead bodies were 
flung out of trenches, right, into, it's like a garbage thing. So, you know, there'd be a heap of dead bodies and the soldiers' dead bodies would be flung from the trenches with a big bayonet sometimes, uh, flung in a big heap of corpses, right, and that big heap became a very, very iconic symbol of human destruction, organic destruction. So again, the sense of trash becomes important, how human bodies become disposable trash, everything organic becomes disposable trash. We see this uh, almost obsession with trash throughout modernism and we will move on to this Virginia Woolf short story from here after this called Solid Objects, which is entirely about trash, right. But even if you take a look at Mrs. Jalloway, A Wasteland, even Eliot's early poetry or Ulysses for the matter, we find this whole idea of trash becomes important because along with the different machines of production. Uh, in modernism and modernity, in cultural modernity, we also see different machines of dissemination and also production entails the production of rubbish, the production of trash and then the human body is now converted into a trash, right. So, it flings it to the wastepaper basket, but such a uh, grinding feeling of wretchedness seized him that he felt positively frightened. So, again, it is a bit of an oxymoronic expression, positively frightened. So, it is being seized and consumed by a certain sentiment, uh, you know, and he is frightened by the sentiment. He started forward and pressed the bell for my say. Bring me some fresh blotting paper, he said sternly, and look sharp about it. So, again, he wants to desperately to clamber back to his masculine rhetoric. He, he was trying desperately to, to get back and recover and retrieve and re articulate his masculine vocabulary. Look sharp about this, how a manly man speaks to his underling. He wants to recover his sense of ownership, his sense of agency. But then it is too late, as we are told. And when the old dog padded away, he fell to wondering what it was he had been thinking about before. What was it? It was, uh, he took out his handkerchief and pressed it inside his collar. For the life of him, he could not remember. So, this is how the short, how the short story ends. But what happens essentially is this becomes a very sweet revenge of time. And as we mentioned, the boss's hubris was that he had thought that anyone, everyone else can live the loss down and move on with time, but he will have triumph over time in the sense of retaining his original experience of trauma. And this is what I mean when I say there is an equation of trauma and privilege in the story. Because you know, the boss thinks that I can consume, I can re experience my trauma at will at any given point of time. No passage of time can dilute my trauma in that sense, right. So, that has been a hubris all the time. That every time I want to cry at my son's death, I can cry at will, I can weep at will, I can retain and re articulate and re experience my trauma uh, very, very experientially and viscerally in a very embodied way. But of course, this fly episode obviously, you know, just completely ends and you know, finishes any sense of struggle for the boss because the fly struggle comes to an end symbolically and in a very projected kind of a way, his own struggle comes to an end as well, right. So, the fly and the boss end together, right. So, now he goes back and he's trying to recover his bossness. He's trying to give orders desperately to Macy to bring some fresh blotting paper and to look sharp about it. That's his that is all that you can order for. I mean, also notice the way in which this office, uh, there is no indication of any work getting done, of any productivity at any level. Everything is just coming and being designed as empty structures. The boss comes, there is an office, there is a very decked up office, there is a messenger, etc. But do not quite know what work is done, if any, any production happens at this office at all, maybe not. So, it just becomes an office in a very hollow, emptied out kind of a way. Because obviously, the person who would carry on the production, the son is dead now. So, all the boss is doing now is just, you know, uh, stalling uh, the, the collapse of this entire architecture. And the last statement is important for the life of him, he could not remember, right. This becomes a very sweet revenge of time when he cannot remember what he was thinking, right. In other words, um, you know, he becomes quite essentially and symbolically and literally a timeless man, right. He becomes someone who is, you know, um, denied of time. So, timeless in a sense, it does not have a future obviously because the son is dead but also he cannot recover the past because he cannot remember. So, you know, obviously his present becomes precarious in that sense. So, the precarious quality of his present is because of his timelessness. The father does not have a future to look forward to and also uh, there is no past that he can think of, right. So, uh, so when I say this is a vendetta of time, what I am saying, what I am actually saying is uh, time leaves the boss, right. And this, in that sense, it is timeless. So, you know, time goes away from the boss entirely. Uh, and you know, you know, he is denied this comfort of time in every which way, and this becomes a vendetta. This becomes a revenge of time, very symbolically and experientially, uh, a revenge against this erstwhile hubris of having control over time uh, in terms of you know never living this loss down, right? So we see how this entire story is deeply, deeply psychological, as you can see. It's very existential, psychological. It's very modernist. 
uh, with the first world war as a very spectral background throughout the story as you can see you know which is something we just saw in the wasteland as well and also mrs Jalloway more directly uh, but if you compare and contrast this with mrs Jalloway, we find that the, the minimalism in, uh, in mansfield's uh, short fiction actually makes it uh, very very um, sinister and quality. So the sinister, cooled quality about loss is conveyed to us in very minimalist ways. And there's hardly any characters, hardly any action, except a fly episode, which is deeply psychological. And we find how streams of consciousness, epiphany, uh, this entire embodied engagement with time, all these become uh, very important markers of masculinity in the story. So in one sense, it's very modernist. Uh, it's, it's always engaging with consciousness. In other sense, it's also very, very, uh, it's, it's a deep feminist, critique of a certain kind of masculinity which had historically created the war in the first place, this expansionist kind of masculinity which the boss embodied. So with that we come to an end with the flyer. It's a deeply psychological and complex story. So do read it again and again. And like I said, I have a an article on it which was published in the Cathy Mansfield uh, and Psychology um, collection uh, published by Edinburgh University Press, which I'm happy to upload in the forum uh, for your perusal. So from this, we'll move on to the next text, which I'll announce in due course of time. So do reread the fly and write to me in the forum if you have any more questions or comments on this text. Thank you for your attention.